Good morning. Hello, hello. Welcome, everyone. Um, a great good morning from Vancouver, Canada. It is Holly and I are super excited to be starting our day with you all. So I know we have several folks registered from around the world joining us today. So if you can type in the chat your name, perhaps a little bit about your business, and then also where you're joining us from. Um, additionally, we have two questions in the poll for you all that we would love for you to answer. One being if you are an entrepreneur or an RCIC, Registered Canadian Immigration Consultant. And the second one is, if you are an entrepreneur, at what stage is your business in? So I'll give you all a couple of minutes to get settled and answer the polls. Hello from Ethiopia. Thank you for joining us. And I think we'll give it five more seconds for the polls. We'll do five, four, three, two, one. Let's have a look at who's in the room with us today. Oh, and yes, if you do have any questions throughout the session, please feel free to type them in the chat. And also, we do have a Q&A um, section at the very right of the column um, with a little box and a question. Feel free to click on that and type your questions in there as well. And at the end of, towards the end of our session, we'll be answering some um, questions that you all have asked. So... With that, I will start my presentation so you guys can know a little bit more about Spring. Perfect, there you go. So a little bit about myself, I'm Lorreen Katubai, a program associate for Spring Activators Impact Startup Visa Program. We also refer to it as ISV. Um, I support the operations and back end of a program with the amazing team at Spring. So this also likely means that if you apply or join for Spring's program, I will most likely be your main point of contact throughout the process. And a little bit about myself. I am Filipino, but I was born and raised in Hong Kong. And I've been really fortunate enough to live in both Seattle, Shanghai, and Vancouver. So I've been a permanent resident in Canada for over five years now. But just over the summer, I became a Canadian citizen. So I'm hoping that this journey will be similar for you all. Um, so having lived in a few countries as well, I understand what it feels like to go through the immigration process, as well as undergo the joys and challenges of learning how to um, live in a new country. Um, additionally, with over seven years experience in bridging the world of purpose and profit through business, I'm passionate about business impact strategy, community development, and creating a pathway to a purposeful and sustainable economy that's inclusive of all. So with this combination of my personal experiences and professional experience as well, this drives my passion in working with Springs community, um, specifically entrepreneurs, perhaps like yourself, who aim to make the world a better place through their business. So now that you know a little bit about me, um, we can move into what exactly is a startup visa program. So you'll be hearing a little bit more in detail from Holly in just a few minutes, but in the shortest form possible, it's an immigration pathway to Canada. So Canada's startup visa program um, actually started out as a five minute five year, not minute, um, year pilot program that became a permanent program in 2018. And this was to foster economic growth within Canada. So if you go through the IRCC, Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship of Canada, we like our acronyms in Canada. Um, if you go to the IRCC website, there are over 50 business incubators supporting startups through this program, the SUV process. So what exactly makes Spring Activator different from the rest of them. 
So the clue is in the slides. Some of you may have already spotted it or heard in what I've been saying um, in the earlier slides between ISV and SUV. It's also right up here in bold on the slide. And the big keyword is impact. And so here are four points of the many different points that I'd be happy to share um, that differentiates, differentiates Spring Activator from the rest. So one being, um, as I mentioned, the SUV program became a permanent program in Canada in 2018. Mm -hmm. um, but interestingly enough, Spring Activator became a designated entity in 2017. So being one of the most, um, the early business incubators to um, enter this space, um, Spring has a deep knowledge and experience of how this program and process works. Second being, um, we call our program Impact Startup Visa because we are the only designated organization in Canada that actively selects entrepreneurs who want to make the world a better place through their business ventures. And that doesn't necessarily mean that your business has to be only environmentally focused or um, has to have that immediately as its foundations. Um, if it seeks to create social impact through whether it's product or process um, in its operations. So an example would be, you know, if diversity in the workplace is of um, a major value, um, having sustainable practices or being um, curious to balance profit and purpose um, in how you run your business. These are all things that would make a startup impactful. Um, so whatever it may be, Spring is here to help you grow and scale that impact that you want to achieve. Third, if you've had the opportunity to go through our website and had a little bit of look of who our team members are, um, you would have seen a very diverse team operating across multiple provinces in Canada, but also across some different countries in the world. So we are here to support your transition into Canada in whichever that may be. Um, additionally, we're fortunate enough to have a wide network that extends beyond our team as we work with many partners um, in the global community. And lastly, um, while we are impact focused, we welcome entrepreneurs from all industries and at all different stages. So whether the industry you're in is food and beverage, health tech, agri-tech, clean tech, all the different types of techs, consulting, education, consumer goods, all are welcome as long as you have impact at the core of your business in mind. And additionally, Springs Impact Next Startup Visa program is also cohort based um, because we believe in the value of peer learning and the importance of networking and building that community, especially because you are moving your business as well yourself and your families to a different company. So these things go hand in hand. We have graduated 18 cohorts to date, supporting over 200 entrepreneurs over the last six years. Our Impact Startup Visa Program alumni group represents entrepreneurs from over 30 countries in Asia, Africa, South America, Europe, and the Middle East. Additionally, the Spring team values feedback as we believe in continuous improvement, as you all might believe, as entrepreneurs as well. Um, we ask our participants from every cohort to evaluate the program based on the Net Promoter Score, NPS. Um, and this is what they think of the program and what, the value, what they think of the value of the program, as well as would they recommend it to other entrepreneurs. So our NPS consistently averages at about 90% or above. So we're quite proud of running a high quality program with a high personal touch for each participant and um, the participants with each other as well. So our overall objective of the Impact Startup Visa is to help you move to Canada, apply for the PR status, scale your business globally, and also create positive social and or environmental impact through the very act of doing your business. Our 12-week program with 24 virtual sessions is led by serial entrepreneurs, very experienced entre entrepreneurs, um, and facilitators and industry experts to introduce you to the Canadian startup ecosystem. 
Um, we'll help you develop a business model that is driven by impact. Our cohort-based model encourages collective learning, experiences, and building community, and most importantly, building community during, but also most importantly, also after the program, once you've landed in Canada. So by the very end of the program, you will have learned the fundamentals of running and building a business network, um, as well as community of like-minded peers in the business space. So if you have any questions, again, please feel free to drop them in the chat box and also um, in the Q&A section, which, as I mentioned, you can find at the very right. It looks exactly like that icon. Um, so now that you learned a little bit about myself, a little bit about Spring Activator, I'd love to bring the stage up to Holly Gracie, the very wonderful Holly Gracie, who will share a little bit more about the SUV program and her wealth of experience. Over to you, Holly. Thank you so much, Lorraine. You're so much more bubbly than I am first thing in the morning. <laughs> it's the coffee. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, so happy that you were coming to share with us. Hopefully, you can see uh, my screen. So a little bit about me. I've been involved in the business immigration consulting for 38 years. But in addition to that, we do a lot of business consulting and planning, organizational structuring, as well as international investment consulting. I have 26 years of governance experience on boards of directors for professional associations, as well as the regulatory body specific to Canadian immigration, international investment, as well as education. 15 years of experience as a subject matter expert relative to the Canadian immigration, international investment, international education for educational institutes, professional associations, as well as two of the regulators of immigration consultants in Canada. And lastly, 14 years of experience teaching Canadian immigration law, inclusive of the economic class, which pertains to business immigration in Canada as well as business practices and ethics in Canadian business investment and establishment of businesses internationally. So my apologies that I come across as an educator in many ways when I'm presenting. So what's the objective? The Startup Visa program falls under the economic class of immigration. And it refers to a category of immigrant who is selected based on their skill sets, their qualifications, as well as what their potential contributions will be to the Canadian economy or culture. The SUV program is just one of many programs that fall under this class of immigrant. So the objective of the SUV program is to attract innovative entrepreneurs who will create employment opportunities for Canadians and stimulate economic growth through global scalability. So the basic criteria for the program is targeting immigrant entrepreneurs who possess the skills and the potential to establish a business in Canada that's innovative. So it might be a new product, might be new ideas, might be new methods. Uh, creating employment for Canadians is a key aspect of it. And ultimately that whatever you're doing can compete on a global scale. Applicants under the SUV program must meet specifics, have a qualifying business, secure a letter of support from a designated organization, meet language requirements, and have sufficient funds for resettlement, and I add, and business establishment, because that's not clearly outlined in the immigration uh, website details. So what is a qualifying business? It needs to have the support of a designated organization. Each designated organization may have their own focuses, as Spring uh, was indicating earlier, they have a, an impact uh, focus. Um, ultimately, the business will need to be innovative, create employment for Canadians, provide economic benefit to Canada, and have the potential to compete on the global market. And you can have up to five people on your SUV, SUV team, meaning that five Key, key players would be able to secure permanent residence and or work permits. At minimum, each applicant must hold at least 10% equity or more in the venture. 
those applicants that might be uh, teaming up with a designated organization that is also putting funds in, uh, such as angel investors or venture capital funds, um, they must hold at minimum 50% of the total issued shares. And since share structure is an integral part of the assessment, businesses must be incorporated before you apply for permanent residence or ultimately the work permit associated with that PR application. So what's a letter of support? So this is the letter that's issued by the organization that's designated by the government of Canada and may take the form of a business incubator like Spring, a venture capital fund, or an angel investor or angel investor fund. As noted, specific lang language benchmarks must be met. So all applicants will take a language test from an approved organization and meet the minimum language benchmark, which is set by the minister, sorry about that typo, by the minister responsible for, the, for immigration to Canada. A lot of people wonder, well, what kind of documents do I need? And you know, most typical applications for immigration, you'll need to show your, your passport travel documents. If you have a Canadian temporary visa, uh, your official language exam results, the letter of support, birth certificate, marriage certificates, police clearances from all countries where you've resided for six months or more since you attained the age of 18, digital photographs, and proof of settlement funds. But what don't they list? And these are really vital. And most importantly, a detailed business plan. And this has become even more important in recent applications. They're really taking a keen uh, look at what business planning has and what due diligence has gone into your business plan. Um, evidence of your education and work experience, because this shows what kind of experience you have that would be transferable and logical to manage the venture that you're planning in Canada. Proof of incorporation of the business. Proof of any prepaid expenses or investments which you've made in the business up to the date of you making the application sufficient assets to establish the business. So that's in addition to resettlement assets, you also have to be investment ready. Any other in evidence that might support your ability to become economically established in Canada? Uh, for example, if you have ties to Canada, if, you've, if you have family living here, or if you've done business here. Um, and lastly, immigration medical exams would need to be undertaken for not just the main applicant, but also each of their dependents. So it's possible to apply for a work permit once the permanent resident application has been submitted. And this would allow applicants and all their accompanying dependents to secure temporary status in Canada. Uh, applicants are issued a, a employer specific work permit at present. Spouses and dependent children can seek either work permits, study permits or visitor status. Keep in mind that dependent children are, are typically under the age of 22, but there are some exceptions. Statistically, the success rate has been up and down. In the formative years of the program, we were seeing 80%. However, the number of applications was really low. Uh, There's only 113 applications submitted, 47 applications were approved. 11 were refused, and thus 55 didn't even get finalized. Between 2018 and 22, we saw a real increase of applications coming in, um, but we also saw approval rates drop down to only 70% of those cases assessed, many being refused based on not meeting the objectives of the program. So as of 2022, because they haven't actually issued the 2023 stats yet, there's an estimated 12,000 SUV applications in the backlog. And that's why we're seeing a processing time of three and potentially more years to finalize these cases. Um, Canada has announced plans to increase the number of cases processed to address this backlog for the next three years. And currently the average approvals is ranging in the 76% uh, level. So that's my presentation. Um, I've 
provided some contact details should you wish to, to follow up on, on any immigration specific things. But I'm going to stop sharing my screen and open it up to questions and hopefully I can answer anything relating to immigration and Laureen will be answering anything relating to, to spring and the incubation process. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Holly. Um, you mentioned you were an educator, and I definitely feel a lot more educated about it. <laughs> <laughs> so, I was totally bored. <laughs> that was very insightful, um, and I hope the audience members have also felt that was super insightful. So, as again mentioned, feel free to drop in any questions. Um, but we do have a couple questions that we want to um, answer in the Q&A. So the first one being, what exactly are the current language benchmarks? OK, well, the minister has established uh, a current CLB level five in English or French. And that's mm -hmm. on each of the four components of an official language exam. And that would be for English, it's the Celtic or IELTS. It's a general, not the academic. For French, it's the TAF Canada or the TFC Canada. And just to put this into perspective, a CLB5 equals a, a Celtic 5. Uh, most people are more familiar with IELTS internationally. Uh, that would be an IELTS 5 on every component except for reading. They actually accept a, an IELTS 4. Mm hmm. And do I have, you know, Canada is an English speaking and also French speaking country. Do I have to do both or do I just do one or the other? No, you only have to do one. And it's just mm -hmm. the, the prime applicant, not uh, spouses or, or dependent. I see. But each, each, each team member would have to undertake a language exam. I see. And then another question we have is how much money do I need to apply for this program? Or just in general, how much money do I need to do the SUV? That's a really good question. Um, and there's actually two considerations here. So first of all, you have to think about how much is needed by Canada Immigration for Resettlement. And they have a, uh, it's called the Low Income Cutoff uh, or LICO. And it's based on the size of the family unit, which includes the applicant and their dependents. And they base it on what's needed for sort of six months of, of cost of living. So a single applicant might need a little over 13,000 or a family of four might need to show a little over 25,000. Noting that these figures are as, as of this month, they're changed annually. But I'd like to put a little disclaimer here because the cost of living in Canada is really high. And I think that it's really important that anyone who's planning on migrating to Canada, you have to think about what your personal needs are. Uh, the more, the better. Uh, do your re research on when, where you intend to resettle. Get an idea of the cost of housing, food, living expenses. Make an exploratory trip if you haven't already. The second consideration needs is how much is required to establish your business in Canada. And that really depends on the business venture proposed. Uh, so this will be defined in your business plan. Uh, so I can't really tell you exactly how much you need to invest. It has to be logical for the business that you're planning on doing. Mm -hmm. I second that advice so much, Holly. When I first moved here um, and having done Hong Kong currency, I was like, oh, things here are really cheap. And then when you do the conversion in Hong Kong, <laughs> it's the exact opposite. Just because Hong Kong uses a lot more like digits for whatever item, whereas in Canada, you know, you can find things for $5, $10. So it sounds cheaper, but when you do the conversion, it's actually a lot. <laughs> so that was definitely a little bit of a shock for me. Okay. So staying along, yeah, so staying along the um, topic of funds, so how do I obtain proof of funds? And then also, what could proof of funds look like? You were, you were cutting out a bit, but I think I understand what the question is. So, so proving proof of funds, and again, this would be twofold. So there's resettlement funds. And specifically what the government's looking at uh, is you providing letters from your bank stating when the account was opened, 
what mm -hmm. the current balances are. And then these should be supported by bank statements. I usually show um, the last, well, usually the last six months on submission. Sometimes they go back more years because they want to make, prove the, the providence of the, the, uh, the funds. Funds may be in the name of the main applicant, or they can actually be in the name of the spouse or your common law partner. So that's relating to the LICO, the settlement funds. Uh, investment funds, they need to be uh, showing that you're investment ready. And this can come from various sources, from your assets that you might liquidate or you might be financing parts of it. Uh, what I usually suggest my clients put together are uh, proof of all their bank accounts, proof of all their real estate, uh, proof of all their businesses, any stocks, bonds, or other investments. But you also have to couple that with the liabilities, so mortgages, credit card debt, et cetera. So we have a clear picture of what the total net worth is. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and then another one, because you had talked a little bit about timelines and the average right now is three years. And hopefully that will become less. Um, but do you have any insights on what the current processing times are? Or if we do want to apply for this program, what should are just general timelines and expect expectations be? Okay, well, as of today, the IRCC is posting a 37 month processing for permanent residents, which mm -hmm. is horrible. Mm -hmm. However, we may see these speed up. Uh, immigration levels were recently tabled and they've increased the number of applications they'll process overall per year. Uh, of the overall number of applications that they're going to be processing, which was in the range of 465,000 to 500,000, only a fraction of those are actually federal business cases. So the federal business case, they're going to do 5,000 per year. Uh, only a portion of those will be startup visa applicants because there are, are other type, types of federal business cases. So that's for the actual permanent residents. If people want to come here sooner to start their business, and most of my clients do, they apply for the work permit. And the, the processing times really vary depending on where your current country of citizenship or habitual residence is. And I was just doing a, uh, a quick look at the range. I mean, you can get a work permit in 10 weeks if you're from Brazil, but it's going to take 73 weeks if you're from Italy. So, mm -hmm. um, a lot of my clients are coming out of Nigeria right now. We're seeing about 11 weeks for them. Um, some of my other clients are coming out of uh, People's Republic of China, only 12 weeks, which is great. Uh, my, my poor Iranian clients, they've got to wait 39 weeks. So it really depends on where you're coming from as to how long it will be to acquire those, uh, those, those work permits. Mm -hmm. Along the lines of work permits, we do have a question from Dahl. Hopefully I'm saying your name correctly. Um, and the question is, if it takes three years to process startup visas given the backlog, it seems the work visa is necessary if doing business in Canada. Is this correct? I would I would say that it's it's it would be necessary from my perspective. It's not necessary from Canada immigration's perspective. Not every SUV applicant um, wants to physically be in Canada until their PR has been issued. So some do wait. Um, it's more logical for them uh, because of their business involvements overseas. But the vast majority of my clients certainly want to come over and do business as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. So they usually seek out these work permits. Mm -hmm. And then another one on uh, um, different types of visas um, or statuses in Canada is, can I apply for the SUV program inside, inside Canada with a visiting visa? Well, everything is pretty much done online now. So technically, it doesn't really matter where you are. But the processes for certain types of applications uh, are considered being done outside of Canada. So, so mm -hmm. technically most applications are typically done outside of Canada uh, as far as the, the forms are, are entitled, but you could physically be in Canada at the time when the submission is made. Mm -hmm. 
And we have one question from Taha. I also hope I'm saying your name right. Um, and this individual runs a crypto company. Um, so all of their funds are in crypto. Um, how do you show this proof of funds, which is in crypto, to prove that they do have the funds to support themselves and the startup? Is crypto a type of, um, like, is that something that we can see as proof of documentation? or It, it hasn't been defined as such, and mm -hmm. it may be in the future. Um, it's a great question because I'd like to know that too. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't have the answer other than what Canada Immigration is specifically asking as far as documentation. Uh, it's pretty hard to prove cryptocurrency because it's not documented. So I think you might have an issue uh, at current uh, regulations and policies proving your, your net worth or resettlement funds or investment ready uh, investment uh, funds. Mm -hmm. That may change as Canada becomes more open to cryptocurrencies. So I, I guess it's a big question mark at, at present. Mm -hmm. And I think that's too um, a, a value that's really important with an RCIC. And when you do pick one, perhaps like Holly, um, is it's natural not to know all the answers, but the important is following up instead of, you know, doing the research. As we know, immigration processes change so often. So having um, working with an RCIC that you are comfortable with and that is um, going to be there to help you find the questions to your specific situations um, is really, really important. Um, can, I just, can I just add to that? Because you're, you're talking about RCICs only and there are other authorized representatives as much as I like to promote all the RCICs because I am one. But um, the lawyer is in good standing uh, with a, a Canadian Law Society, as well as in 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 Quebec, notaries are are acceptable uh, authorized representatives as far as the Canadian government is concerned. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that, Holly. So your options are endless. It sounds like. <laughs> um, so with that, um, we have a question here that says, "I have heard that there are proposed changes." What are they and when will they apply? Okay, that's an excellent question. One of them has already applied, been applied with the tabling of the numbers. The rest are still on the table. We're waiting to see what's happening. So the first one was increasing the number of cases processed to decrease the backlog. So that's basically been announced already with the immigration uh, numbers being tabled. Um, the other ones which are very interesting, and I'm hoping that they come in into uh, enforcement, is that they're talking about making the work permit valid for three years as opposed to only one year. Because currently when you apply for a work permit, it's only valid for a year, then you have to reapply to extend it, and that can be problematic. It makes m much more sense based on the, the processing times for PR to make the work permit valid for the duration of that process. Mm -hmm. um, they're also talking about allowing the work permit to be an open work permit as an as opposed to an employer specific one. And currently, when you apply for a work permit as an SUV applicant, it's specifically for your business only. And you can only work for that business within Canada. An open work permit would allow you to work at your own business, but also do other things and work for other employers. So that can actually create um, a lot of economic benefit to Canada because a lot of uh, applicants have great skills that we need. Uh, work permits uh, would be issued not just to the essential team members, but to all team members. And perhaps you can talk a little bit more about essential team members and non-essential to clarify that if needed. Um, and then prioritization of SUV applicants who are supported by a business incubator or an angel investor fund. So I guess they're not going to prioritize those doing venture capital support. So that's the plans. We don't know when they're going to happen or if they will happen, but that's what was announced back in June. Mm -hmm. 
And, uh, you know, with these changes, um, especially with this three year one, would you recommend that we wait a little bit? Or do you think what would be your advice for um, an entrepreneur wanting to do the SUV program? Well, you know, it depends on what stage they're at. Um, If they're ready to proceed, then I would say go for it, you know, go go get your work permit because you can always you can always change the uh, terms of a work permit and it's done online. It's fairly straightforward and then get that extension of time. It wouldn't be a problem. Um, but if, you know, someone's in sort of the, the planning stages right now, it might be well worth, you know, waiting until the end of this year to see if these changes come into being. Mm-hmm. Um, So we have here another question, um, and it is, what kind of businesses does Spring support? So uh, um, as mentioned, Spring, we support businesses from all different stages, whether you're in the very early stage, idea stage, or you're revenue generating. Um, So all industries are welcome. Um, Food and beverage, clean tech. um, We have a lot of um, like consulting different types. edutech, everything. Um, I recall when I first started, um, we had a um, like mining company as well, um, taking waste from mining um, sites and making a product out of that. So all type of businesses we welcome. And it's also one of the parts that I really enjoy about um, my role at Spring is I get to look through everybody's applications and learn about your businesses and the different types there are and um, the different um, solutions that they bring. So here we have another question um, and it is, what are the main, excuse me, what are the main reasons for refusal? Excellent question. It's something that I uh, was just researching recently. I, I haven't had any refusals myself, but so I looked at some of the, the court decisions. And this is where someone has been refused and they've actually taken it to uh, appeal. So it gave me a good idea of what some of the problems have been. And these were the, the primary ones. Uh, if there were substantial changes to the business plan after the commitment certificate was issued and emphasizing without informing the government. So, I mean, changes can be made, but you've got to disclose that and it may impact your your applications. But if you disclose it, there's usually a way to mitigate it. But if you don't disclose it, this can result in a refusal. One of the biggest ones was poor business planning. Uh, incomplete market studies, weak competitive analysis, irrational revenue projections was a huge one, lack of marketing strategy, lack of relevant experience of the applicant compared to the proposed venture. So, you know, someone who had uh, experience in one industry and was planning on getting involved in something completely different with no transferable skills, that would be questioned and under scrutiny. Lack of evidence of why the business should be set up in Canada and not overseas. So there has to be a logistical reason why it makes sense for being in Canada. Or ultimately not enough progress shown in business establishment. So they, you know, they they came with a plan, but they didn't really do anything once they were physically here and there wasn't enough progress shown. So ultimately the primary concern and reasons for refusal was the applicant um, applying primarily to gain Canadian status and not really intending to engage in business. And unfortunately, some people are just looking to gain status in Canada, understandable, great place to live. Uh, But this particular program is for people who really want to do business. And so if your intent is not to engage in business, perhaps look at different options for for migrating to Canada. So ensure that your intent is in the right place. Mm -hmm. And when your application does get refused, could you speak a little bit more to what the appeal um, process looks like? I can a little bit. This is one area that RCICs can't represent on because it's before the federal court. So this Mm -hmm. is where you would actually need an immigration lawyer 
should you so choose to have representation. Some people do represent themselves. But you first have to apply for leave for judicial review. So this is where you, sh you have to come forward that there was an unfair handling or uh, an injustice uh, in the processing of your application or an error. And they would decide, OK, either yes, they agree that there was a mishandling, uh, or they wouldn't. So if they agree, then it goes back for review. So it might be the same visa officer that's reviewing it, or it could be another one, but ultimately it would go back for review, but it still technically could be refused on different grounds. So uh, you want to make sure that your initial submission is really avoiding all those potential pitfalls. And sadly, because the SUV program became really, really popular, once it was introduced, a lot of people jumped on the bandwagon. Um, mm -hmm. And it wasn't so much the, the applicants sometimes weren't sure what was expected of them. But a lot of the representatives involved didn't have the experience in business immigration. And so there were errors made, unfortunately. So I think that uh, when you're choosing a, a representative, you want to make sure that they have experience or if they don't have the experience that they at least have a mentor who does i mentor actually some junior rcics who want to get into involved with the suv program but they don't have many many years of experience so i mentor them in the processes so in that way we make sure the clients are taken care of mm -hmm. um we have a question about spring and it is about how much does Brings ISV impact our visa program costs, and that is a great question. Um, please feel free to look on our website um, on the costs of our program, as um, it's it's in the Q and A, I think. Sorry, frequently asked questions at the very bottom of our website, um, and I think we do have our website linked in the chat somewhere. If not, we can link it again. Um, and then another question around funds, um, and this is a, a little bit of a specific one. And is it necessary to show six months of bank statement for proof of funds? Um, and then also, if your bank account is quite new, is it does it raise any red flags if there are large deposits into it? Like, does that work? Yeah. Um... This, this, if I was a visa officer and I received an application and someone provided me with a new bank account with a huge deposit, I'm going to say, well, where did that come from? So you've got to show where it, it came from. Um, and ultimately, that comes through paper trail and evidence. When you prepare the application, there's, there's something that you'll be required to do sort of a narrative on how you accumulated your net worth. And so this would might start, you know, from day one when you got your first job and you saved money and you bought a house and it appreciated in value and you invested that into a business and, and that appreciated in value. So you've got to prove where it all came from. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say you always have to have six months. Sometimes uh, I go back three years, <laughs> uh, depending on the application. Um, so ultimately, the more evidence you have, the better. Ultimately, they're looking at what you have as of the date that you apply, as well as the date that you are physically uh, securing a visa and landing. Because if that you don't have enough money on your date of landing, you could be refused at the port of entry. So obviously, proof of the providence of your funds and maintaining sufficient assets for resettlement and investment are very important throughout the process, not just at one point in time. Thanks so much, Holly. And that actually brings us to time. We have a minute left. And I do, before we go, I do want to share that Spring Activator is currently recruiting for their winter 2024 cohort next year. So if you are interested or if you have any questions and learning more about how um, or specifically about Spring's 
ISV program, um, please do reach out to us. Um, our email is in the chat and link. Feel free to peruse. And also, um, Holly Gracie's information is also in the chat. With that being said, um, we're right at time. Holly, any parting words or advice to the folks with us today? Well, I just wanted to thank everyone for participating today and coming to listen to us. It's been my pleasure. It's uh, always interesting to to, I wish we had more interchange between individuals so we could actually get to know each other. Um, but to our, our cryptocurrency guy, I, I got to go find out what, what's happening as far as the Canadian immigration laws and regulations are concerning this, because this is becoming huge business right now. And a lot, a lot more of my clients have money tied up in uh, cryptocurrency as well. So I'm going to go do a little investigation and see if we can't do a little lobbying for you. <laughs> and also, um, as we are learning a little bit more about, um, I believe it was Taha, your business and crypto, Holly is going to be doing that research for you anyway, just to see what that information is. Her information is in the chat. So it would be amazing if both of you connected, um, if she can help you with that specific situation. And now we're over time. It is, it's, it's always, time always flies when you're having a good time. Um, thank you again, everyone, for joining us today. All our information is in the chat. And um, have a great day, everyone. Thank you for joining us. And thank you.